very honored and thrilled to have Kevin Wolf with us tonight. We're also delighted to have his wife Alex with us as well, and she's playing a vital role here. She's going to be his <laughs> assistant in moving the, uh, the, the table on. Uh, Kevin, as all of you know, is a, a very renowned architect. He also is a landscape architect. Uh, he has expertise in the restoration of historic buildings and gardens. He's quite a combination. He's a graduate of Holy Cross and has a master's degree in architecture from Columbia, a master of arts from Clark University, a bachelor degree in landscape architecture from City College of New York. He opened his private practice in 1997 but before that, he worked for New York City Department of Parks and Recreation, where he designed the Marine Park Environmental Center in Brooklyn. He was involved in the Bartow Hell Mansion in the Bronx, in the Restoration, the King Mansion in Queens, and the Dykeman Farmhouse Museum in Manhattan. He's currently teaching historic preservation in the Master Program at Pratt Institute, and he has taught at the Institute of Technology and Landscape Design at the City College of New York. He is deeply involved in New York City preservation movement and Open House New York. I know many of you know about this program. It opens up beautiful masterpieces that people are usually not able to see. Um, and that is a very, very active work that he does there. He co-founded the Douglaston and Little Neck Historical Society. And when I was talking with him on the phone, I asked him about how he got involved in Kensington. Did he grow up here? No, he didn't. Uh, and he told me that he had begun working uh, on a book. This is the book. It was put together by the, um, I'm going to get the name wrong, so <laughs> by the Society for the Preservation of Long Island Antiquities. It's now known as Preservation Long Island. They shortened their name a little bit. Um, and it was, okay. he was a uh, I'll, I'll be eating it, Mike. And his background had been in also in newspapers. So I was very interested in that. And he, he walked around Kensington with his camera. And some people were a little bit like, who is this dude walking around in our village? And he fell in love with the place. And he wrote an incredible chapter about Kensington in this book. And I'm sure it must be available in the Brentwood Library. And it's available on Amazon. Uh, and, and it's and it's available tonight too over here. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and I, and I also want to give um, Susan Lacatkin, who is the mayor of Kensington, an opportunity to join me in the welcome. Well, this is a great crowd. I am just so thrilled that we have so many people here: residents, non-residents, anyone who had any interest in Kensington. Um, I, I can certainly say as the mayor that I take great pride in our village. It is some, somewhere I've lived for 29 years <clears throat> and um, I, I just think it's just a fabulous place. You know, we put a lot of effort under my, um, right, uh, under my um, mayorship for the last 16 years to put a lot of um, effort into the, our architectural review board so that we can really maintain the look and feel of our community. We have a very strong aesthetic. We want things to fit in. We're very careful of that new construction. We're very careful of that renovation. And um, we really, really care about our community. And I certainly you know, care very much as well. Um, that um, 2009, we had our centennial, so that was our 100-year party. We had over 400 people celebrating. Um, we had a, a bunch of archive material that we found. 
If anyone's interested, we have it in our village hall. It's public, it's available. If you want to stop by, by all means, there are four big binders full of old articles, the original appropriation papers. It's really fascinating if you like history, so I welcome you. Um, the other thing I want to share is if you read any of the newspapers, Niche is one of these entities that seems to rate villages. <clears throat> In 2023, they rated Kensington as the number one place to raise a family on Long Island. <laughs> so we'll give ourselves a round of applause. <laughs> I'm pretty impressed. They, they seem to like us. I don't know why. <laughs> um, and I want to thank Kevin for putting all the research in and Carol for putting this together. I think it's going to be a great program. I'm so glad everyone's here. Have a great night. And, and come visit. And with that, I'd love to introduce Kevin Wolf. Thank you, Carol. Hello, everybody. I understand that tonight is your uh, relaunch of historical society programs. And that's great. I'm really glad to be here because it's the relaunch of me being out in public talking about anything. So I'm glad to be here. I love this topic, as Carol described, and um, we're going to talk tonight about two different places that are close in many different ways, Kensington and Douglas Manor, which is across the city line. Some of you may know about that. So the Rickard Finley Realty Company is responsible for what Kensington looks like today and Douglas Manor. And when they were starting out, they, they wrote this, the New York Times reported this. With the completion of the electrical equipment of the Long Island Railroad, the first of the roads around New York to be thus equipped, and the connection to the tunnel with Manhattan, Long Island will have the best transit facilities of any region tributary to New York. They're talking about the East River tunnels and the completion of Penn Station in 1910. That's what makes all of this possible, that you guys living here in joy. And the rail lines, this is the biggest land sale in the United States. Long Island's development all starts happening because of these rail lines getting rid of steam, going to electrification, and getting the tunnel so you can be from Great Neck or Douglaston in a half hour. It's pretty amazing. So that, that's what that is. So that technology 115 years ago persists, obviously, and it hasn't gotten any faster to get to Manhattan, by the way. <laughs> okay, next slide. So, Rickard Finley uh, started out with the lar being the largest de developer in Queens. I'm going to talk about the three men that are responsible, the Rickards, two brothers, and Charles Finley. And they're all Midwesterners. They have a very interesting background. But the way they started in New York is they slowly built up to Kensington. Kensington is their crescendo, if you will. So they started out in Norwood, Long Island City. Then they moved on to East River Heights and Astoria. These are all apartment developments. Then they go to Belcourt in Bayside, right off of Bell Boulevard. This is single family houses, one of the first ones they did. Broadway Flushing in, in uh, Flushing. Douglas Manor. Westmoreland, Little Neck, and then Kensington, and those are the years. It's a very rapid progression that they built up. Kensington is the most elaborate, it's the most expensive, it's the culmination of everything they kind of worked for. And these three guys were very progressive. We don't know a lot about them, but they did things that most developers never did then and never do now. Next slide. So these are the players, Charles, Charles Finley, He's from Illinois, Midwesterner. His dad is a Scotsman, a Scottish immigrant. His mom's from Tennessee. And then the two brothers, Charles and Edward Rickard. And you can see that Charles Finley and Edward both graduated from Notre Dame. And that's the connection. That's how they got to know each other as young men. And then the brother got pulled in later. So these are the men who are making Kansas City 1904. So they're really established. They're doing all kinds of developments there. Um, they're well known. They're middle aged, you know, they're in their 40s. They're society figures. Their wives are doing all sorts of things, ph philanthropy there. They have a life there. 
But once they heard about the East River tunnels and Penn Station, they were like, we're going east. And they moved here. And that's how this began. So each of their developments, each of their developments share the same thing. They share that they have views of water or they're actually on the water. And Kensington is very interesting when we get to that. Respects the natural features of the site. The, the, each site follows the topography. It's gotta be near a train station, otherwise it doesn't work. Deed restrictions, property owners association, electricity, gas, macadam roads, asphalt, cement sidewalks, street trees and hedges. These are all farms. There's nothing but meadow for the most part, except at Douglas Manor. They're marketing geniuses. If you think what's going on now with social media, this is the equivalent in their time of using newspapers and flyers and all of that. And they emphasize a healthful lifestyle. Each of these developments is about getting away from the crowded tenements of the city, appealing to the middle class and saying, you're gonna have a healthful life. We don't think of it, but malaria is big. Um, tuberculosis, none of those things have been knocked back yet. So to live in a place where there's green space, tennis courts, things like that, this is part of the deal. So East River Heights, right on the water, looking at the tenements of Manhattan. This was a park that they set up, so they instantly are giving people green space that they could have made money developing, but they, they built this in. Next slide. Bayside, same thing, Belcourt, um, surrounded by farms, beautiful views from the top of the ridge that is Bell Boulevard. You can't tell that now, of course, seeing Little Neck Bay. Next. Broadway Flushing, uh, the ponds that's there, they're next to Casino Park, uh, all of that stuff. This is their sales office, see the little buggy, and they're right off the rail line, like you get off the railroad, and you're right at the sales office. So that's Broadway Flushing. You can see the rail lines in the dark color. Next. Douglas Manor, a peninsula surrounded by water on three sides, and the bottom is the Long Island Railroad, what we call the Long Island Railroad today. That's how you got there. That got you. They advertised that Douglas Manor, would, you'd get there in 20 minutes eventually. Didn't happen, even on an express. Next slide. Sailing. These are what they're promoting. Sailing. Yachting. Douglas Manor. Yachting. This is the aerial. Up, upper right-hand corner is the peninsula from an early Wright Brothers era flying machine flying over. This is 1907 that they're promoting this. Next. Westmoreland and Little Neck, same thing. It's a farm overlooking Little Neck Bay that got subdivided. And this is what parts of that farm looked like. These are some of the creeks that ran into Udall's Cove. Next. And this, if you're right at the edge of Westmoreland, it actually, if you take away the parking lot of the Long Island Railroad, this you can still see from a little park that Westmoreland has if you're scooting between the railroad tracks into Great Neck Terrace, the apartments. That's the view. This is looking the opposite way from the railroad where you arrived. You can see how bare it is. No trees yet, but beautiful rolling hills. And those rolling hills give you the views of the bay. And today, if you go down those streets, you can see the Throgs Neck Bridge all lit up at night on a clear day without fog. You can see it. Next. And they planted trees. So part of the deal in each of these places, they planted privet hedges that the association, the property owners, took care of for every homeowner. They cut your hedges. And they planted trees in Douglas Manor, for example, silver maples, a scourge today because it's a fast-growing tree but that was their replacement for an elm that cost three cents more than a silver maple, and it grew really fast and gave you the same shape as an elm. Next. Here's Kensington and Great Neck. This is a challenging site in certain ways because the bay, the water, is at that far end, as you guys all know, where the swimming pool is, but that was all wetland. There was no clear water there to get you to Kensington. So they had an idea. Train station, the attractions of that site, as you all know, you can walk in a couple of minutes from any house in Kensington to the train and just got electrified, 1910, next. 
Douglas Manor, they promoted it as a beautiful residential park. Um, it had trees because the uh, owner, Douglas's, brought trees in from all over the world, including the first Japanese maples, the first azaleas got planted there from the Casino Nursery, Parsons. Next, the train station. I love these ladies. They're walking, this is 1914. If you know the station, the Weeping Beach that's on the right-hand side is still there. That's a descendant of the original one in Flushing. From, this got planted in the 1880s. Next. These were the owners of the estate in the 19th century, Adelaide and her husband. And William P. Douglas is uh, famous for being a yachtsman. Next. And Adelaide and J.P. Morgan, they had an affair later in life. And she was his muse in terms of collecting art all over the world. And this is one of their trips to Europe uh, on the right-hand side. Society lady from the beginning. And J.P. Morgan hung out with them, sailing, things happened, you know, whatever. Next. The Douglas Mansion. This was actually built before them, 1819, by the Van Zants, another descendant a Dutch family. Um, this was one of the richest families in the country at the time, the Douglases, and the Van Zants before them. This is a level of money that is still going on. No one in that family has worked since the 19th century at anything. <laughs> this is what they lived in. This was their primary house, the Douglases. Next, the Van Wyck farmhouse, still there, 1735. You know, an amazing survivor in New York City because Douglas Manor is part of Queens. Next. And this is what it looked like just before the subdivision with, you know, surrounded by locust trees. Next. And by the 20s, the Douglaston Club had bought that. So that, that's what that ended up. They tried to save not only the roads in Douglas Manor, that the main north-south roads were all Indian trails. So they used the to topo there. They saved all the buildings from the estate. This is 1906 we're talking about, including this windmill, which had uh, powered the estate. And this became someone's cottage. In an aerial view, remember, no drones, no airplanes to speak of. Wilbur and Orville are you know, trying to get their thing off the ground down in uh, South Carolina. And so this is from someone's imagination. And it's amazingly accurate if you look at what it is. So Great Neck, you're just seeing the edge of it to the right, Great Neck Estates. Next. Uh, some panoramas. This is all the material that the Rickard Finlay Company produced to sell this. Brochures, handouts, newspaper ads, all over the place. Keep going. Um, and this is what the bay looks like. The Douglas Manor Peninsula is to the right, and you're looking at Great Neck right across there, what eventually became, by the early 20th century, a lot of estates, and then eventually subdivided again for what you're looking at today. The Van Wyck House on the left, the Douglas Mansion, uh, the road. This is Shore Road today. Some of the trees that you see in this picture are still there. You can identify them, you know, 120 years later. Uh, the Great White, White Oak on Arley Road, Douglas Manor's Arley Road, not Kensington's. So they use the same names. Um, this is another great house that uh, the Douglases acquired as a guest house, the, the Allen Bevel Mansion. And this is what they used. They, they converted the uh, Douglas Mansion to a hotel solely so that people from the city could come out, stay in a weekend, and get seduced by the landscape. This was how they sold this place. New York City advertised that it had the best roads in the United States. And so we're getting, the, you know, Northern Boulevard is the main way. And that's one of the first paved ro roads in New York City. And that's what they're promoting. This is what the house looked like to welcome guests. Next. And then, you know, they gave you all the data about, you know, this arboretum that the Douglases created, healthful living, all of that is part of their materials. Uh, the lots. There was no zoning. Remember zoning? I think you've heard a little bit from Kathy Hochul about zoning lately, yeah. right? So there's no zoning. What they do, there's no zoning in New York City till 1916. So using deed restrictions, they create at Douglas Manor, for example, 
a very middle to upper middle class community. So the right hand side that you're looking at, those are 40 by 100 minimum lots facing the tidal creek of Udall's Cove and the, you know, the, the bay empties out twice a day and you're looking at mud flats. And on the other side, this side, the left, you're looking always at the bay because even when the tidal flux is down, all you see is water. Premium lots, 100 by 100 minimum. So they zone it that way by creating minimum lot sizes. You will find this amusing. No stables. They had common stables that you had to go to. You called up on the latest technology, a phone, and said, bring my horse around. You were allowed to keep a carriage on site. That lasted not very long because by 1910, the Model T arrives and even middle middle class people can afford a car. So the early big houses on Shore Road in, in the manor, they have carriage houses with apartments above because often there were more servants than they had family. They had someone to drive the car. They had three living people uh, living in the attic or a bedroom on the first floor. They had people who walked in and helped out. That was middle to upper middle class life. The most middle class people had help. Next. Someone's ringing. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's all right. <laughs> um, so this is this is the view from the front of the Douglas Mansion. Next, these are some of the typical houses. We'll talk about the styles in Kensington in a moment. Uh, next, uh, this is one of the nicer houses that was built with a beautiful garden, a rose garden, and it was called Rose Lawn. This house is still there in uh, Douglas Manor. Next, and this is. Uh, Lionel Moses is from the office of Stanford White. So if any of you follow architecture, um, the Kim Eden White are among the most famous turn of the century architects. And some of his people worked on houses there, several houses. Next. Um, this is the mast of the Sappho, the Douglas uh, boat that won the America's Cup in 1870, one of the uh, winners. <coughs> And the dock was a major feature of selling this place. Next. The boathouse at the end. No air conditioning. Every kid in creation was down there at the dock swimming every time they could. And you didn't have the level of pollution at Little Duck Bay that you have today. Next. Now, this is 1914, a typical summer afternoon. This is the beginning of the development. There are only about 200 families living there. There are 600 today. Next. Uh, both Kensington and Douglas Manor have a fair share of theater people, movie, early movie star stars, silent screen stars. So Hedda Hopper is one that you would remember. You know, maybe in 50 years we won't remember Brad Pitt. Um, there were a bunch of them like that. You know, the heartthrobs of the era that are vanished names, but they were sprinkled all throughout Douglas Manor. You get to Astoria Studios in your car in 20 minutes on Northern Boulevard. So it was a remote and you could get to theater, Broadway, if you were a theater star, a producer, or a writer, in a half hour to Midtown with the new tunnels. Next. Elbert McGrand Jackson, a famous artist who did Saturday evening uh, post covers. There was a whole arts colony there. Next. And Ginger Rogers, I think most of you know who that is. I have students at Pratt, they don't know who she is. It <laughs> astonishes me, but there you go. Next. Uh, George Gross, if you are into art, his work is in MoMA. He's a German refugee during the 30s. He came to New York. He ended up buying a house on Shore Road. I had the privilege of renovating it a few years ago for the current owners. And the other thing about both Kensington and Douglas Manor is they were very sensitive to the landscape where there was stuff. So Douglas Manor had a lot of big trees as well as meadows. So if that tree happened to be in the middle of a road, you just drove around it. And some of these trees, when I was a kid in the 1960s, were still in place, but a few too many cocktail parties and things, they got all banged up and they eventually got cut down. So that, that's what happened to them. They cut your grass, I mentioned the hedges. They had horses mowing the grass. They had men coming out raking the median in front of your house. You know, Douglas Manor has sidewalks, Kensington has sidewalks. So from the hedge out, they took your garbage out. Every time the garbage men came, they brought it back in. It's service that, you know, we can't imagine today from a homeowners association. Next. Um, the roads were private in both Kensington and Douglas Manor, 
Douglas Manor gave up its private roads during the Depression. They didn't have the funds to keep them. They're all city roads today. And this is a typical house. Uh, you know, they would, I love looking at old plans, and so for the local historical society in Douglaston, we've got donations over the years. They would call this open porch that's part of this house a piazza, which you guys might all think, well, that's okay for Italy, but Queens, really? But that's what they called it. Uh, there were a couple of little parks that were part of Douglas Manor, as well as one mile of shoreline, which Douglas Manor Association still owns in common with all the residents. That is the radical idea, um, to take the shoreline and make that owned collectively is a radical notion in 1906. If you look at Great Neck Estates, if you have a house on the water, that's a wonderful thing, but the house right behind you, they have no access. In Douglas Manor, if you bought a 40 by 100 lot and you were a school teacher, you had access. You had access to the dock, all of the waterfront. It's really a, a clever idea. It also was good for them as developers. They got to sell the small lots for more than if they had just been cut off like the rest of the big lots. Uh, another typical open porches are very common. Again, this is the age before air conditioning. People were out on these porches all the time in the summer. They were not locked in their houses like we are today with the air conditioning blasting. Kensington, those gates, they're pretty amazing, right? And they're still there and looking beautiful. So, Rickard Finley promoting it. They're based on the gates of Villa Aldobrandini in Italy, right? So they're not a direct copy, but you can see side by side the influence. This is what inspired those architects in that time. Next. And Beverly Road, um, in anticipation, the, the farmers that owned that knew that this was gonna, they're, they're planning ahead. These were not, uh, you know, rubes. They planted all these trees the minute they heard about the rail lines coming and electrification. They planted this knowing that this was gonna be a subdivision. So Beverly Road got planted out, even though all around it was meadow. Um, not many of these trees survive today from that uh, original LA, but the trees on, I think it's Arley, the sycamores, they're all intact. They're uh, over 100 years old, that uh, line Arley Road in Kensington. I love this ad. Isn't this great? So this is about the sporting life. This is about golf having its ascendancy and really being something that uh, middle class and upper middle class people aspire to. So they are really interested in promoting that and this idea of very dapper dashing man and a young man. This is not some old guy playing golf. This is a young guy. They're trying to get young people uh, moving up the ladder of middle class to upper middle class to come to this place. And the buildings they built reflect that. Next. So Kenwood is um, the mansion that the apartment house is at now. That was where the gates are. And to the right of that was the other estate. So there were two mansion houses built to promote this and two of the developers built those. So Edward Rickert's Kenwood is the one on the left as you're approaching the gates. And the other one is Bonnie May. And that's, uh, this is still Kenwood, sorry. And um, this architect, Gilbert, is one of the most renowned architects of the time. He built a lot of mansions on Fifth Avenue, uh, all during the early 20th century. And that's why these guys captured him. They're at the peak of their careers as a real estate developers. They've made it. They're having coming out parties at the plaza for their daughters. The plaza's finished in 1912. They're living high on the hog, and they're gonna show that, but they're also promoting their property. Uh, the other brother, he ended up living in an apartment in Flushing uh, that they also developed, but he chose to lead a more modest life. He was the quiet one. Edward talks a lot. He's the one, he's the front man. This is the house. I love looking at these. These are uh, from one of the architecture publications at Avery Library at Columbia. And you know the plans are there. You get to see the lifestyle that these people lived. People don't realize that, you know, you think of the Gold Coast estates, these mammoth mansions like the Pratt's had and some of those that I'm sure you've read about or um, Ohika, which is now a hotel and restaurant. 
But the bulk of the Gold Coast mansions are this scale. They're really not these enormous rambling things that we like to think of in the Great Gatsby and all of that. They're certainly there, but these are among the biggest houses being built anywhere, and they're among the richest people in the United States that are building them. Next. Some interiors. Kenwood, next. And this is the uh, Bonnie Mance, the other house on the right-hand side which the carriage house survives as your town hall if you live in Kensington. So this is your classic you know, take on southern plantation, that kind of look. Colonial revival is what you would describe this as. This is a style that is everywhere in the United States happening. And of course, this look uh, of this plantation style is something that people really aspire to. This is the back of it. And uh, you know these have elaborate gardens. Next. These are some of the pieces of the garden. Um, there's a pool. You know, no one has swimming pools for the most part in this time. It's just the beginning of that. And Hollywood people were starting to build swimming pools, but most private houses don't have that. This is an ornamental pool. Next. A big ornamental pool, but you know, a pool. <laughs> And then this is what they marketed to uh, develop these lots. So all of the lots in Kensington, for the most part, are bought by individuals who hired their own architects, which is not to say that some developers didn't buy them in both Douglas Manor and Kensington. Individual developers bought individual lots and developed them in, at a small scale. That's always been going on. But it's not like other places that you may be more f familiar with post-World War II where they buy a tract and one developer does everything. That's why Kensington and Douglas Manor look the way they look. Next. Uh, this is one of my favorite little factoids. Possessing an elevation of 150 Street, practically eliminating mosquitoes, malaria, and other objections to water level locations. Right? You don't even think of that. So we all think like being on the water is a fabulous thing, but it depends. You know, you don't want to be too close to the water. You want to be up looking down, you don't want to be on the flats near the water because you don't want to get malaria. I mean, imagine that. So your waterfront is to the right. And this is my favorite part of all about Kensington. It was decided that as Kensington could not be moved to the water, the water would have to be brought to Kensington. So remember the Panama Canal? That's going on at the exact same time as this. And the Panama Canal and this body of water are the same size. They're the same width, and they dredged that all the way from way out yonder to get to here, and then they developed that parcel that has your, if you live in Kensington, the public swimming pool and the, the garden there and the courts, that's what they developed. So they wanted to have a, a boating dock that you could get there and have a yacht with some depth that would not get stuck in the mud at low tide. So they dredged all of that. It's an incredible operation to do what they did in 1909 to make this happen. And that's the waterfront, because it was not a peninsula. So this is what it looked like. I think this is an astonishing photo. If you go down there today, you know this is astonishing. It's filled with Phragmites now. It's about, I don't know, a quarter the, the width of what it is in this shot. Next. The general environment added to by the lights of many Japanese lanterns and of boats on the canal will serve to complete the illusion of complete isolation from the Western world. Do we have some aspirations here? And will undoubtedly attract many motoring parties from Broadway for dinner in this unusually beautiful spot. And Edward, of course, is the guy saying this. So they, they had the idea that from You'd go to a show on Broadway, and then you'd drive out here and hang out in what they'd created, this incredible Japanese garden that's described that, you know, there's not a vestige of it anymore, of course. They started attracting all kinds of celebrities, of course, same as Douglas Manor, for the same reasons as Douglas Manor. They're going on simultaneously. Uh, a lot of these you've never heard of, I'm sure, but some of, some of them you have. Um, Woda House, Gene Vogt, Flo Ziegfeld, 
Um, there are a lot of famous people here, and there are many more. I mean, you could go through the roles of theatrical actors and silent film actors, and they're sprinkled all through Kensington. This is a beautiful photo. So this is these little boxwood parterres that are private dining spots where your party can gather around the pool and have its table. These ladies look a little bored, especially the lady in the black hat with her. <laughs> she got stuck, still, still happens, right? And uh, you know the swimming suits that the guys are wearing, I think it's 1938, they finally make it legal for men to take off their tops. Um, next. And this is the uh, pool house that was built there at the end of the pool. This was modeled on Hadrian's Villa in Italy. Again, these allusions to um, classical architecture, classical things. Um, the very finest is what they wanted to do. A very severe building, but if you know Italian architecture, it's severe. And then you can really see all the parterres on the left and the right and in the back, and then the striped awning for those shade lovers who can't stand being out in the sun and have to be under an umbrella or an awning. And another great view of it, um, they had sand. This is at the bottom of the slide is sand. So you're seeing that they did this stuff so that the kids would have a good time as well as the adults. And this is one of the largest pools in the United States, by the way, at the time it's built and stays that way for quite a while. There's Hadrian's Villa at the top to give you an idea. You know, again, they're not copying it, they're inspired by it. That's, that's what this is all about. And, you know, having fun with their children, life rafts, you know, all, all this stuff. And people, of course, the ladies with dresses to the floor, um, because you have to look good, you know, that still goes on. And here's the cars, I love, I love this shot. They're playing tennis, so there were tennis courts there, uh, the Japanese garden that's described, all this stuff. This is Charles Finley. So Charles Finley's, uh, you know, the one in Bonnie Mance, the right-hand side of the gate. He has a daughter named uh, Neva, and Neva marries a man, and within two years he comes down with tuberculosis. They're young, and he, makes an offer that he will pay $1 million to anyone who finds a cure for tuberculosis. And this is him announcing that in New York City to get someone to crawl out of the woodwork and save his son-in-law, which his daughter later divorced. He lived for quite a while after this. <laughs> and Neva, by the way, was an early pilot after she divorced her husband, and she died in a plane crash uh, down south in Georgia at 36, uh, flying solo for some competitions that she was in, very tragic. So this is uh, in New York City, they're coming out, all the announcement about tuberculosis. Next. And then we get into the houses. The one on the top is still there. It's one of my favorites, very severe, Italianate looking house. It's really gorgeous. And, um, all different eclectic styles of architecture are the norm at this time in American history, right? Early 20th century. We're looking at every architectural style you can think of. Here's some more, you know, colonnades, um, hip roof on the bottom, that's that big, see how big the roof is? Covered with beautiful materials, Mediterranean tile, slate, all the finest materials, uh, cedar shingles. Some more, the most modest house is probably that one at the top. All the others are, I would say, the realm of the upper middle class. Um, unlike Douglas Manor, which has a real mix of middle middle to upper middle class income people uh, buying homes there. Here's some more, another uh, you know, southern plantation takeoff. And also, you can see they're merging all different kinds of styles if you follow architecture, the one on the bottom with a gambrel roof. Um, next one, um, the top one, arts and crafts style, if you know the uh, designer Gustav Stickley, um, there's a lot of arts and crafts going on, beautiful tile work in these houses on the exterior. This is all the influence of the arts and crafts movement. Uh, some more, uh, Georgian colonial revival houses, the top. 
And this is how they're promoting them with these plans. These are in architectural journals. You can see, if you study these plans carefully, you can see the life that people lived. No open concept plan, thank you. The kitchen was the realm of a cook and no one went in there unless they were desperate because you were gonna get served in the dining room. You could sneak in there, but that's about it. Next. So what happens to these places? What are they like today? Douglaston, the 1990s were the beginning of the assault by developers. The limousines start arriving, the bigger lots. Let's tear that down. Suddenly, you know, a 70-year-old house built in the teens. We can replace that with something new, and it's worth it for the developer for what he'll make, putting up something quick and fast. Here it comes. That's the beginning. This is what got the residents of Douglas Manor riled up and finally a movement to have New York City landmark status. Tara, this is what replaced the old houses. Cheap, uh, in architecture school we called this semiotics. That portico, uh, the, the rocket ship columns, like that portico is gonna go up in space soon. <laughs> that is semiotics, that's a symbol of wealth that gets you know, rethunk by somebody into something like that. So what Tara wants to be, the house on the bottom, is what our friend Charles Finley already had, right? This is what that aspires to, and when you look at this, you can see how the idea of that original building gets reduced by the developer into the cheapest thing he can get to make the maximum amount of money, and tell somebody, this is the symbol of a wealthy family that lives here, this porch. Um, in Douglaston, there were carriage barns, you know, because I told you it's the beginning of the auto age, so there were still horse and carriages. This is at the edge of the historic district. So just before designation in Douglas Manor, these started getting torn down and replaced by. Here, here's big trees going down. You can see how deep the lots are. Next, the evil twins. They often come in pairs. <laughs> they do. I mean, just right around Douglas and Little Neck, there are lots of pairs like this, the evil twins. Same thing. Um, so 1997, after nine years of uh, working with the city, trying to convince them that suburban architecture was worth creating a district for, the residents of Douglas Manor got a district. And last year, we celebrated 25 years of his historic district, New York City historic dis district status in Douglas Manor. And it's astonishing what that designation has done for the place. All you have to do is drive across the boulevard in Douglaston or Little Neck and see the evil twins have now occupied entire blocks, every house torn down and replaced. Um, so this is what the manor looks like today. This house on the bottom, you know, looks pretty much like it did uh, 100 plus years ago. This was built in 1907. This is a Gustav Stickley house, if any of you know him. This house is basically untouched except for the front door got replaced. Stuff like that happens. That's kind of normal after a century. Next. And this is the shoreline that they all own in common. Uh, the Douglaston Dock, 200 feet long. People actually swim off it and boat off of it. And Udall's Cove, I think a lot of you know about Udall's Cove, a great environmental battle of the 1960s that took 30 years to accomplish uh, on the city side of being a New York City park, nature preserve. Kensington, let's take a look at that. So, one of the obvious things, long, long, long ago, um, that mansion got demolished and it's on a busy street and that's apartments today. The opposite side, uh, as any of you who live there know, is the town hall and the old carriage house, and there's a park where the mansion and its gardens had been. Beverly Road, then and now. So you can see the place has grown up, a century of growth, trees come and go, but it's still this lush, amazing place when you drive around Kensington. The pool, um, stuff happens over a century, you know, the pool, had, I, I don't know the story of why buildings got torn down or pool replaced, but right now you have, uh, if you live in Kensington, kind of a 1960s, 70s, I'm not sure when this was rebuilt, rehabbed, 
but none of the original fabric of what was once there, including the dock, remains anymore. That's all gone. And Phragmites, the invasive, has come right up to the shores. You can't even tell you're on the water there. It's, uh, you know, and it's all industrialized around it. It is not, the shoreline leading up to this park is not what Rickard and Finley imagined was going to happen. They thought all of that shoreline that they dug, they dug a canal past other people's property expecting that would be developed the way they had developed, and that didn't happen. It got industrialized. It's the story of New York's waterfront, right? Not an uncommon story. And, you know, two different things. It's functional. It's a great place to go. It's still a great attraction for families to go down there every summer. A uh, wonderful thing. Uh, but Hadrian's Villa, that inspiration uh, disappeared a long time ago. Next. So you still have these amazing houses. I was there the other day walking around. I hadn't been there in a while. And the houses that have survived are really spectacular. This is the one I told you about that's based on an Italian villa. And this is, you know, for some of you, you may look at this and say, it's a very severe, plain house. And it is. But as an architect, I love it. I just look at this house and I marvel. It has the most beautiful garage that has the original carriage house doors. It's really incredible. Next. And this house, when I did this presentation a few years ago, I was told that this was going to be torn down and replaced. However, it's still there. And I don't know what happened, but I'm happy to see it survived. It's a wonderful house. This is, uh, obviously, it's got Tudor beaming. This is leaning into what we call the arts and crafts style, which a lot of those are hybrids of other styles. And this fabulous uh, colonial revival, Georgian style house, you know, stretched out, big, long, beautiful house. Look at the materials this is made of. Um, these beautiful garden features with the lattice pergolas that uh, mark the entries. Beautiful lawn. This is, you know, relatively close to the street, but it's a big, gorgeous lot. Springtime, you couldn't find a nicer place to be walking around Kensington. So this is one of the ones. Um, a lady named Nina Gordon, I don't know if she's here. Yeah, she sent this photo. This was her family's home, and I, I don't know when, it was still standing when, uh, okay. So this is the replacement. So this house on the right, Nina Gordon's house, family's house, is what we would call arts and crafts. It has Mediterranean tiles, it's brick, um, it's a, you know, as solid a house as you could build at the time. And why someone chose to tear it down, I have no idea. But usually it's because it's old, or it's this, or I can't imagine what it could be, and it gets torn down. So that's, that's the replacement. So you can see the difference in 100 years ago and what people might want today. This, when I was here the other day, um, this site, I'm not sure if it's a tear down, but there was nothing on the site. So this is a development company that operates in Kensington. And this is their idea of, um, I would call it, traditional architecture. So they're using materials and totems of traditional architecture that reflect what someone who doesn't want a contemporary house would want. So as an architect, I'm trained in everything. And you decide what you want to do with your life. Um, so traditional architecture is what I do as an architect. And this is a version that developers do if they're doing a new building. They want to hit you with the totems of this isn't you know, squeaky clean, modern glass, all of that. They're trying to appeal to a segment. And this developer appeals to that segment. Next. So you know, for me as an architect, the question is, what style is this? Fairy tale. Fairy tale, exactly. But fairy tales don't usually look like this when you look a little closer. Right? Yes, the fairy tale right. gables, and then it's got this um, balustrade above that's about 25 feet long. So, this is stuff where people are just like applying appliques of design to give the fairy tale the traditional uh, feeling. And then, this is just the power of the garden. This is not a criticism of the house on the right. I look at gardens, since I design gardens, I look at gardens as upholstery. Upholstery wears out sometimes, and you just have to start over. 
So we don't know what happened on the right. These houses are side by side. But what makes Kensington wonderful is the gardens. And the Tudor on the left, that has a garden that some people would go, oh, it's overgrown, you know, these big glob, globby bushes and Japanese maples that are, you know, doing this. So, but sometimes you just have to start over. But I'm showing you this just to show you the power of what landscape does for a building. This is a very nice building on the right, a very cute house. And when it gets its landscape back, hopefully soon, you know, it's gonna take 15, 20 years to grow in. You're looking at landscape on the left that's, you know, 70, 80 years old in all likelihood. Next. And this, I was fascinated by this. This to me is a happy story because this is a split level from the 50s or the 60s. And you can see the outline of it on the left where the white uh, cladding is. And that's the higher part, the garage is under that. It's a typical split level you'd find anywhere on Long Island. And this architect, um, he's in mid process of construction. He's made an effort to let's make this split level work for a contemporary family. That's why they're expanding it. Split levels are tough. They don't often work for families today. That's what I find as an architect that people complain about. And he's giving it a roof line that matches with its neighbors, the older houses. I love seeing projects like this. This is a really nice thing. I'm anxious to come back and see what it looks like when it's all done. So these are two doorways and two houses. The one on the right is the one I showed you a few minutes ago, the Italianate Villa and its doorway, super reductive, very plain. Some people would say to me, I don't like that, Kevin. It's so fiercely plain. All of its detail is in that lunette above. It's made out of terracotta and marble, 1910. This house is fairly new. And you can see the difference. It also has a big impressive door, but the door's kind of a black hole. You know, it's not inviting to you. And that's kind of what happens over time is this is a take on traditional architecture. And you can see that even though this is quite a grand big house, the new one has like three wings coming out from the center part uh, to get the space that whoever built this wanted. So I don't know what was here before, or if it was an empty lot, but this is, this is the difference in two different approaches to making a grand house. Next. So I'm gonna leave you with these two images. This to me is what Kensington is all about. Since I'm trained as both a landscape and an uh, architect and an architect, I love, I'm always thinking about the connection of the house to the garden. And Kensington is a place where especially the early houses, there's always a connection of the house to the garden. So this house on the right has a pergola that almost reaches the street. It goes all the way out to the driveway and has a lovely garden all around. It's really beautiful. And this is uh, another house that was in the early ones. It's probably from around 1910, 1913. It has this beautiful arcade. And the other day, just the other photos, some of them are older, but this I took the other day because everything's just budding out and this tree draping over, giving you this view of this house and the azaleas are about to burst. This to me is what Kensington's all about. When I was here the other day, I, I, on Sunday I walked around, I was delighted to see how many people are walking around. It was a beautiful day, certainly, but people walk around Kensington. That was the whole point of making a place like this. Douglas Manor, Kensington, Broadway, Flushing. They're about making walkable places where you can walk to the train and be in the city in a half hour. So you have tremendous resources here, a beautiful place. Thank you very much. Thank you.